Thank you. So let's start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on, on second, uh, the second edition of the Specializing Master of Nuclear Safeguards. I'm Marco Ricotti. I'm one of the co-director of this uh, uh, of this master. Uh, let me introduce uh, our our colleagues and also our guest. Uh, first of all, Caterina Piluina. Uh, she is the manager uh, of INEN uh, for the master, and uh, uh, Miss Electra Cigaridas. Uh, she is the manager from the European Commission that. Uh, if we are here today, it is because of the of the interest and the initiative uh, from the European Commission. Uh, welcome to everybody. I'm very happy to to see to see you online. Uh, let me give the floor to to Katrina and uh, Electra first. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening to everybody from my side as well. Mentioned mentioned I am Katerina Pilugina uh, representing NN who is the main implementing partner, partner uh, of European Commission in uh, the master and together with uh, Politecnico de Milano we implement this uh, uh, program. So uh, we are happy to have all of you here with us and uh, this is uh, really a very solemn occasion and we are very happy that uh, this is happening and we, we will have edition of this a uh, very important uh, program, not only for uh, us involved in, in this program, but uh, I believe even for the world. So welcome and uh, we, are, we are happy to be with you today and for the whole program. And I give the floor to uh, Electra Tukaridas from uh, the European Commission, the, uh, the organization who provide funds uh, to make it uh, this program happening. So, please, Electra. Thank you, Katerina, and a good day to everybody. And I'm very happy to see you all so many faces gathered for this inauguration. Actually, it is with great pride that we are inaugurating the second edition of the Master's Fund on Nuclear Material Safeguards. It was a long way to arrive to that day. Uh, this master was conceived under the European Commission's International Nuclear Cooperation, uh, nuclear, safeguard, nuclear Safety Cooperation Program, where safeguards is one of the three main areas of action. We are financing uh, the development and organization of training on safeguards in various regions around the world. And then we decided that a more substantial educational qualification program that would provide the needed qualification is necessary as well. So a master's degree program uh, was created that did not exist yet anywhere in the world, and it was so needed. So the Commission, the European Commission decided to launch and finance this project that, against all odds, succeeded to launch its first edition during COVID, back in 2021 and 22. So and, act, and actually with very good results indeed. So uh, on behalf of the European Commission, I wish you all students a uh, very fruitful and very satisfying 14 months, more or less, in this program. Uh, I, uh, I hope you will enjoy it and you'll find it really uh, interesting. And I also hope that you, that to the good successful results for all of you that will propel your career and you'll be able afterwards to have interesting uh, posts, career posts in the area of safeguards. So good, good year ahead of you and good classes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Electra, and thank you, Katrina, for the, the introduction. Now uh, we can start with the first session. Uh, the first session of the out of the three that will uh, will populate our our afternoon. Uh, the topic is about the overview of the specializing master on nuclear safeguards program. Um, together. Thank you. 
so uh, by this uh, session one we would like uh, you uh, uh, where this uh, uh, nice idea came from how it happened uh, what is the uh, our success story uh, and we will share some uh, interesting information with you uh, out of the first edition of master and also uh, we will share some uh, scientific insights we got uh, out of the work already done by the moment so i invite uh, uh, our first speaker today in this session uh, Mr. Gabriel, Gabriel Lazaro Pavel, Executive Director of uh, NN, uh, with his uh, uh, history and background overview of the establishment of the program. Please, Gabriel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katarina. So, good afternoon, morning, and good evening, everybody. As Katarina said, uh, I am Gabriel Pavel, I'm the Executive Director of the European Education Network, and uh, uh, I would like to shortly present to, to present to you the the background, basically the background of the whole project and the whole approach. I share my interest. Oh, no, no, please. Okay. Um, basically, this uh, uh, project, because it was an educational and training project, started um, quite a few years ago with the aim at providing, um, let's say, uh, authorities, national authorities, uh, support in terms of increasing the capacity of their uh, uh, human resource. Um, this uh, introduction of uh, uh, safeguards was basically um, established long time ago, long before this uh, uh, project uh, started. And uh, this introduction and started, this introduction with, started uh, with uh, the uh, underlined the safety, importance safety of standards, safety, safety and standards the importance of and the importance the of nuclear control of nuclear materials. Uh, why is that? Because uh, why is that? Because all nuclear installations properly maintained. And properly and maintained and operated, and also, we, and also need we all uh, need to uh, control what control what nuclear materials, nuclear are materials are going to let's say either be used, uh, and, then after be used they and then after to they use what to materials. do with those nuclear materials. Uh, and this role, uh, and this role uh, of safeguarding, uh, of safeguarding, uh, of, of, of uh, taking care of the nuclear materials, the nuclear especially, materials especially uh, the ones that uh, are, the ones that are used and then uh, used discarded, and then off, discarded uh, had off, to be uh, had to be let's say uh, let's say uh, carefully uh, looked uh, carefully so looked there upon. several uh, so there were several methodologies uh, implemented, uh, methodologies in, terms implemented in terms of there several uh, approaches when it comes to not only verification but also to uh, uh, cooperate and to show to the neighbors to other countries that whatever you do in terms of nuclear activities uh, this can uh, at any point be uh, analyzed, at any point can be visible, at, at any point can be, let's say, uh, seen as a, a peaceful use of these uh, uh, materials. Um, this can be done following several treaties, several, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, official documents recognized by the majority of the countries in this world. So we are talking now um, about the Euratom Safeguard Treaty, which is in place since uh, um, almost 1960, or, or then uh, about the IEA Safeguard System, which is uh, which started in 1961, and also uh, the very famous uh, Treaty of uh, the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Um, the scope of this project was also to see what are the um, approaches, so to present the approaches um, stated by the additional protocol or to, um, as I said at the beginning, to support the national authorities in keeping these uh, um, obligations. 
that's why when we started this this master program, we targeted mostly the persons who uh, either worked in the nuclear uh, nuclear regulatory authorities or who uh, had a clear chance or wish to uh, to go to the, to support the national nuclear uh, um, regulatory authorities in um, in uh, keeping these uh, uh, approaches. Um, when it comes to Europe, because the uh, um, European uh, Union or the European Commission is the main funder um, of this uh, initiative, um, Europe has, uh, let's say, this uh, global view of trying to play a key role in, uh, um, in uh, 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 keeping the safeguards with high standards, at least especially in terms of uh, human resource. So that's why uh, European Commission tries to support extra EU countries in strengthening their, uh, their capacities. So in uh, national regulatory theories, uh, in uh, uh, try, the uh, EC tries to support this NRAs in, in strengthening their uh, capacities. Um, European Union has also some uh, dedicated research centers. Dedicated means that uh, uh, there is a high level of expertise in different sites across Europe where they can they can provide um, expertise. So highly qualified experts are, are working in this field in, um, um, I think, in four or five sites across Europe uh, today. Uh, and uh, we are happily collaborating with these sites. And then uh, you will see that towards the middle of the uh, training program, you will also, uh, some of you are going to visit these sites and see uh, exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying uh, um, that the highly qualified people are uh, are there. Um, and then here also uh, plays the role of uh, uh, putting everybody together, plays the role of bringing together all these uh, nuclear experts in trying to provide you the best uh, training program as possible in, uh, in safeguards. Okay. Um, historically speaking, we are strongly collaborating with uh, over 15 national regulatory authorities, and we are representing, let's say, the interest of uh, of uh, 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 these safeguards across the whole globe. So the INSC program is dedicated to the um, the whole uh, uh, to the global uh, um, network, if I may say so. Um, we have um, developed this uh, program based on our uh, previous experience, um, either by projects that are still ongoing or uh, uh, from projects that uh, already closed uh, their activities, such as the ANET project, which you most probably are not aware of, but uh, at least for NN, this was the I believe this was the first project where we uh, basically started with a, a few courses in nuclear uh, uh, safeguards. Uh, we are trying to move a little bit forward with this uh, project, and then we uh, uh, propose to the European Commission also the development of several uh, schools in nuclear safeguards, so summer schools, so, so, summer uh, schools, so uh, let's say activities that are not um, or that are um, spread it across a more limited uh, duration. And then this uh, uh, master is basically the, um, uh, the most advanced uh, um, educational program that uh, um, it is offered today in terms of nuclear safeguards. Okay, uh, and then as an organization, and then means European Nuclear Education Network has about 90 members and collaborators. Uh, universities, research centers, um, national or international organizations, sister organizations. So, although an end means European nuclear organization, we have very strong collaboration with uh, other uh, entities that are uh, again uh, dealing with nuclear education, but from other continents. And we are also involving uh, specialists from uh, for example from the IEA from as I said joint research centers and so on so we are collaborating with the strongest player in the players in the field uh, out of these 90 members we have strongly collaborated with Politecnico di Milano 
in delivering this master pro program because at the end of the master program, you will receive a diploma, which is basically officially recognized at EU level. So you will have an official certification uh, of your studies. Okay. Um, as regards the project itself, the whole project, not this master, we started this, this initiative in 2019. Uh, but with this start, we faced a very difficult situation because it was exactly at the beginning of the pandemic. So we had to adapt, strongly adapt our approach. But luckily, this master program was foreseen right from the beginning uh, as a blended program. So we offered the possibility for you, for the students, to, to attend the courses uh, online, but we also had to uh, uh, perform this experimental session in presence. So that's why we think that uh, uh, this approach was um, uh, a winning approach. Uh, and especially during the pandemic times, it was indeed uh, something that was uh, some sort of a visionary approach, which helped us uh, a lot. I think that's it, Katya, Katerina, and back to you. Thank you, Gabriel. The, very interesting to know uh, how this uh, program was born, actually. But uh, it is also very interesting to know uh, how the first edition uh, was uh, implemented. And uh, I invite Marco Ricotti, the director of Specializing Master, to tell us the success story of the first edition. So please, Mark. Yes, thank you, Katarina. Uh, I would like to focus on just three topics, three good reasons why we could say that the first edition was a success story, and I'm sure also the, the second one will be, will be the same. Uh, first of all, uh, about the participation, uh, the gender balance and the country of origin of the people that attended the first edition. Uh, we were able to set up a classroom that was 50-50 uh, or even more than 50% uh, attended by female people. Uh, and this is something very important, uh, not only for the European Commission, but, but also for Polytechnic Milano. Uh, we have for the first time uh, a, a new rector. Uh, she is a lady, uh, Professor Donatella Asciutto, she is very, uh, very engaged uh, in uh, supporting uh, the, the participation of, of women in STEM, in, uh, uh, in the education, in, in the training uh, of uh, engineering uh, topics here in Politecnico, uh, but also on uh, supporting them uh, after graduation. So uh, first of all, uh, the gender balance and also the country of origin. Uh, in also in the second edition, we have people uh, participating coming from Africa, from Asia, from Far East, from Middle East, uh, and from Latin America. This is also another important uh, feature of the of the master. Uh, the second of success, I think, is uh, the multidisciplinary approach that we implemented. Uh, since the beginning, uh, there is not only technical or engineering features. Uh, we have to look at the legal issues. We have to look at at the uh, at the international uh, uh, relationship uh, and the political uh, side, the historical side. Uh, and this is very important for nuclear uh, at large. Uh, nuclear as uh, other uh, um, sectors, uh, but especially nuclear, I would say, is a quite a complex, uh, a complex topic, and we need to address uh, by uh, taking care uh, to an holistic approach. Uh, there is not only technology; uh, there are other issues that are uh, as far as important than than technology. Uh, you will see in, in the structure of the modules that we try to address all the key and critical aspects of safeguards, but it's the same also for uh, other, uh, other sector of, of nuclear. 
we may think about uh, security or, or safety or technology development is the, is the same approach. Uh, we see now a, a very uh, renewed interest all across the world, uh, I would say even in Europe, uh, about nuclear. Um, and we have to be, to be able to address uh, that renewed interest in nuclear, uh, also taking care of a topic that is uh, not a secondary topic. Safeguards is very important. Uh, some of you will uh, will address uh, that issue, for example, for the new technologies uh, in their project work and the final project. Um, in the first edition, we had some students addressing the uh, safeguards by design for the small modular reactors or for the advanced modular reactors for the new technologies. This is this is an example of the topic that we should start addressing immediately since the design phase. Otherwise. It could be too late if we uh, we start uh, taking care of that critical topic later on in the uh, in the development of the design itself. And let me go to to the last point that, in my opinion, is uh, the third reason of success of the the first edition. Uh, and I I sincerely hope that it will be the same also for the second edition. That is the community the community of the students. Uh, there was the, the, the chance to, to work together, uh, even if a good part of the, um, of the master is online, uh, but you will have the, the opportunity to, to have uh, uh, interaction uh, during the webinars and especially during the basic labs and the experimental uh, labs and the advanced lab and probably also on the project it work for some of you uh, that we may work uh, together. Uh, this idea uh, of setting up a community during the master, but I would say also after the master, uh, is an important issue. Um, especially in Polimi, uh, we have a, a clear interest in science diplomacy. Um, Attending this master and working together and also keeping the link uh, after the master, uh, you will be uh, key actors in that science diplomacy. Uh, you will implement science diplomacy. Uh, nuclear is a, is an, a critical and important topic. needs collaboration uh, to be successfully uh, uh, performed. So, um, this is the the, uh, the wish that I will uh, uh, I would like to 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 see implemented also for the second edition. I, I'm sure you will uh, you will find uh, the opportunity and you will be glad to collaborate uh, in a very uh, very interesting classroom uh, from people all across the world um, and and to start uh, uh, working together and even after the the master to to keep contact uh, among you. Uh, last, let me thank uh, first, uh, also the colleagues from the scientific committee, the advisory board. Uh, uh, they are uh, among the most expert people in the world on safeguards, and they were very very uh, positive and open to to collaborate with us, uh, giving a, a tremendous. Uh, help uh, in uh, letting this master successful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, so we now uh, see and uh, hopefully our uh, uh, students uh, now see that the program they entered is uh, of a very great importance and it is something unique and uh, they are actually very lucky to, to be part of this. So, and we also are very happy that uh, you uh, made it to this uh, stage. So, uh, and now I would like to invite our uh, third co-director of Master Nuclear Safeguards, uh, William Janssens, uh, who is a, a representative of DG uh, GRC of the European Commission. Uh, being the head of the Department of Nuclear Safeguards and Security, he will provide us uh, scientific insights 
uh, in, re in the relation to the um, program. Please, William. Thank you, Katarina. And it's a particular pleasure to see, uh, first of all, the students again. We saw each other already last week, but we also have a few students from the previous edition on board, and then also a bunch of our lecturers that will come on in the different modules during the year. So, uh, first of all, all a warm welcome. And after uh, Gabi and uh, Marco's presentation, I'm glad to um, share a few elements as well. Basically, more the scientific part, but nevertheless, a few details on the second edition to start with. I mean, as we started last week, you know that with the first module, you see on this slide that we will have uh, in total 11 modules. And there are two uh, periods of on-site presence. One is the um, basic laboratories, which are foreseen in April 24, and the other, which is also the basis for the master thesis that are taking place from September through November. So um, you will find on the website, in fact, much more detailed for the schedule, but this is just uh, to share with the entire audience that the length of the program is slightly longer than in the first edition because the experience showed that somewhat more time was required also for the project work. Uh, the student distribution, Mark already indicated it, we had over 100 applicants, in fact, from which in the end 21 uh, outside Europe could be funded. Uh, and we have at the moment three students also from Europe. And you see here the distribution through the different continents. And you see also the type of uh, origin profession they, they uh, get. Yeah, I, I can't show it full screen because then it becomes black. <laughs> um, so we have two genuine students which are still at university, but we have quite a few uh, participants from different authorities, as you can see, uh, both national and international. So it's a very interesting mix, I think, uh, as we had last time, that will allow us also during the group work and during the discussions to have an exchange of experiences not only with the lecturers but also between the students and also as Marco indicated the gender balance this time is perfect 50 50 um, and you see the um, educational background where we have um, let's say a bunch of engineers we have also people with a legal background the political science and then other uh, scientific and technical disciplines. Uh, you see a few of the people with the nuclear background, but not only, and that's important also because we can definitely learn from people with different experience when we discuss the different modules in safeguards. To show you what these modules are and what the type of topics are covered, uh, I just have a slide with the uh, topics that the students worked on in the first edition for their advanced labs and thus their thesis. So Marco mentioned a few. You see the big popularity of uh, nuclear material measurements. I mean, 10 students uh, choose to do a thesis on non-destructive analysis. But one of the key messages I wanted to pass in this short presentation is that safeguards is way beyond no, only nuclear material measurement. Uh, you see there were topics on statistics, satellite imagery, safeguards by design, strategic trade, um, and multilateral assessments and so on. So it was a quite broad set of topics and we hope to be able to offer also in the second edition a similar type of uh, menu basically for selection by the students. This will be done uh, somewhere around February, March when you got to know what the content of the study is and, and which are the opportunities and that we can profit from the same kind of wealth of expertise. And in fact, for that purpose, I, I put on this slide just to say that uh, most people focus on, on the nuclear fuel cycle only when we speak about nuclear uh, or nuclear safeguards. But we have a rather important element of the legal basis, uh, the different verification technologies and also the geopolitical situation. I mean, we live today in animated times. We will discuss that in the panel three later today, uh, that there are quite a few challenges, in fact, to safeguards uh, that are relatively new, in fact, due to the geopolitical situation. And that introduces the next slide, which is a little bit complicated, but I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, you heard about the Joint Research Centre, which in fact does over 50 years of safeguards R&D. And occasionally people ask, do we really need to continue doing R&D or are we able to do everything already? And in fact, this slide basically uh, tries to indicate that at all the levels, starting from the right hand side, so the materials where we still have to improve on spent fuel measurements, the processes where we uh, have to keep a close eye on, for instance, enrichment facilities, you all rec recall the details of the deal with Iran. Uh, but also on, on facility level, like the first final geological disposal that is being taken into service in Finland, needed a fully new approach for safeguards because we were not able to, to do it before. We had never applied it. And also at the level of the, the, the countries as a whole and the relations between countries, so the, the trade, the uh, import-export control, uh, are important elements that feed the safeguards analysis. So this is just to show that it's 
although it's a, a field with already uh, quite some maturity, there are still quite a few of scientific technological challenges. And that's why we are all the more pleased that we have this bunch of students that can help us to uh, address those. And you see on the left hand side just the, the pictures of three of the uh, GRC sites. So one in Karasu in Germany, one in Gehl in Belgium and one in Ispra in Italy, just north of Milan, that are in fact doing this kind of research and that will be able to host some of the students also for their master thesis. And then as a last slide, I wanted to show you the content of the European Safeguards and Research uh, Development Association, ESARDA, which in fact also exists over 50 years. Uh, and that has been put together in Europe because as you might know, uh, safeguards is an acquis communautaire, as we call it. So it's a, an obligation of the European Commission. And in order to get support for that, uh, the member states were asked to um, deliver equips to the European Commission. And that's why this why this association was created. Um, and the bread and butter of the association, you see it in all the different working groups that we have on the left hand side. So which is very close, in fact, to the content of the master program also. So destructive analysis, non-destructive analysis, containment surveillance, implementation of safeguards, verification technologies, and a few more working groups that you see there. And I put in the middle something that many of you have, uh, some of the students at least have followed already. There is um, complex to this full-fledged master program, there is a one-week uh, ESARDA course. The next one will take place in April 2024. And if you Google ESARDA, you will be able to find the registration for that. Um, this is mainly for those students, you, I mentioned we had 100 applicants, that uh, could not necessarily be admitted and that might still nevertheless want to get up to speed in a more condensed manner for safeguards. Uh, that would be a, a, an appropriate course for them. And I put a picture that was taken about a year and a half ago when uh, Rafael Grossi and Massimo Aparo signed a practical arrangement with the ESARDA community to even closer work together between ESARDA and the IAEA. And you see on top also something that you might want to find on the website of ESARDA, namely the entire set of bulletins and the in the meantime peer reviewed journal for nuclear safeguards and, and uh, non proliferation. And with that, I, I thank you for the attention and look forward to the rest of our program this afternoon. Over. Katarina, floor is yours. <laughs> um, thank you, William. It was uh, interesting to know, uh, and now you, you have uh, the whole picture of uh, and uh, overview of the uh, specializing master uh, on nuclear safeguards program. And uh, this is uh, what we, um, let's say, propose you to to know for the moment, but uh, so uh, another very interesting session, uh, which is uh, uh, in, which involves uh, our honored high-level guests, and the moderator for this session is uh, uh, Marco Ricotti. So and he will uh, support us, and uh, so to follow, so we will follow the path, and we will know now what are the main perspectives of improvement of education and training in the area of safeguards. So, Marco, please. Yes, thank you, Katrina. Yes, the topic of this second session is about the perspectives, uh, perspectives from uh, uh, our, our guests uh, representing the agency, IAEA, uh, the GNR, the Director General on Energy in the European Commission, uh, the JRC, the Joint Research Center, uh, WNU, the World Nuclear University, and the GINPA, the, uh, the International Electra. She's a project manager. Uh, let us start with the, the agency, IAEA. Uh, we are glad to, to, uh, to share with you a, a video message uh, Director General, General Rafael Grossi uh, recorded for us, so I think that we can uh, we can share the video. It is a pleasure to address the opening ceremony of the specializing master on nuclear safeguards. I'm pleased that the success of the 2021 course had led to a second edition and thank the European Union, Politecnico de Milano and the European Commission's Joint Research Centre for their commitment to this very important effort. All of us know 
that we need a strong pool of experts to take on the growing task of implementing nuclear safeguards around the globe. Safeguards are an indispensable foundation of international peace and security. They are also one of the most complex and sensitive areas of the IEA's work. This course will familiarize you with the legal framework in which verification activities are conducted and the rigorous procedures involved. From satellite imagery to environmental sampling and from containment seals to surveillance cameras, you will become familiar with the comprehensive set of available tools. Safeguards may be meticulous, but it is far from static. The ever-changing environment in which safeguards are conducted requires continuous adaptability. Each year, more nuclear material and a greater number of facilities are placed under safeguards. New technologies are developed, requiring corresponding verification measures and updated safeguards approaches. That means we also need a broad skill set and teams with appropriate gender and geographical representation. Safeguards inspectors have increasingly diverse backgrounds and in their daily work, they are supported by analysts, linguists and IT specialists. As the verification effort increases in volume and complexity, the IEA and member states need to continuously strengthen the effectiveness and the efficiency of safeguards. This is particularly true today when we are facing a geopolitically financially challenging environment. That is why I have... One example is COMPASS, which I launched in 2020, providing states with comprehensive tailored assistance over a two-year cycle, COMPASS is already making a tangible contribution to improving the accuracy and timeliness of safeguards reporting. The specializing master on nuclear safeguards is another example, and I commend you for putting it into action. The benefits of this course extend beyond the education of future inspectors. It will put those students employed in the nuclear industry into a stronger position to environments when designing or deploying technology. It will help operators communicate more effectively with domestic and international inspectors and respond confidently to requests for access or information. Personnel working on the safety and security of nuclear material will be able to better explore the synergies between each of these critically important areas. In closing, let me commend you all, the organizers, faculty and students, for making a unique contribution to safeguards through your commitment to this course. You can count on the IEA to continue to support effective, efficient and resilient safeguards, thereby fulfilling our very special international mandate. Thank you and I wish you a productive course. Well, th thank you, first of all, thank you to the agency. Thank you to Director General Rafael Grossi. Um, the, the, sorry, the connection was uh, quite poor, but you will find the video on the website right, for sure, so you, uh, you can uh, listen, watch to the video and, and listen to the, the speech from uh, Digi Grossi that anyway you understood from the last words uh, is very supportive of the master. Uh, I want to thank the agency for the great uh, uh, that uh, he's offering uh, since the first edition to the, to the master. Uh, I see here connected Jacques Bot. Jacques Bot was uh, a key player on uh, on the safeguard issue in the agency. Now he retired, but he's still very active and he's still offering uh, his, uh, uh, his contribution, his help. Uh, Master, I sincerely thank him and all the people in the agency.
that are uh, uh, supporting uh, the, the master by offering their, their experience and sharing their knowledge with, uh, with us. Um, now, let us go to the, the second speaker. Uh, I saw that uh, Mr. Stefan Lecter is connected, uh, director of Euratom Safeguards in uh, DGNR. Um, uh, Stefan, the, the floor is yours. What, what about the, the perspectives about safeguards from, from your side? Thank you yes. for being here. I uh, hope you can hear me well. I'm switching on my video now as I'm talking. Um, thank you all for switching off the video when you are not talking. That has helped a lot for the transmission of uh, Mr. Grossi's speech that increased if the I bandwidth. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Is that okay? Yes, now is okay. Thanks a lot. Yes. So I um, would like that we are experiencing also in the Director General for Energy a scarcity of nuclear know-how. In Euratom safeguards, we are having roughly 220 posts, of which a little bit more than 100 are genuine nuclear inspectors. We are seeing that there is a big swing in the academic landscape to just go for renewable energies, to go for everything green and wind and solar, and that this is very attractive and also politically very strongly promoted. We also see that there is a nuclear alliance driven in the EU mostly by the French, also understanding that in the year 2050, some 10 to 15 percent in the European energy mix will still be from nuclear. So the choice is always with the member states, and some member states have decided to abandon nuclear, other member states have decided to put their bet on nuclear, France, and yet others are considering entering nuclear, as Poland is doing. So if we want to reach the climate goals and climate objectives together, we must understand that without the nuclear share, the 2050 goals will not be reachable for the European Union altogether. We cannot just discard a technology that is climate friendly, and that is proven, and just understand that this will not contribute when the member states, in their uh, competence to select their own energy mix, have partly decided to use nuclear. But to use nuclear, we also need nuclear competence, and to safeguard nuclear materials, we do need nuclear safeguards competence. And this is very difficult for us to acquire. Nuclear safeguards in the EU is mostly located in Luxembourg. Let's not talk about the additional protocol activities where um, some non side letter states still have their own approaches and administrations, but the Luxembourgish part of the European Commission is not located in Brussels, which is making it difficult for us attracting interested stuff from the European Commission. And we cannot hire as everybody else in industry can do right from the street. We need to go over the European Commission system, over the European Personal Selection Office, having an open call for in then a very complex competition and then establishing reserve lists. So getting know-how and people there is very, very complicated. And therefore it's important that we have a continuous inflow of competence. I do understand that, of course, we also need to have international counterparts. The IAEA needs to have international inspectors and also developing countries um, supported by the international partnerships director general have to develop safeguards know-how. This is important as is important safeguards in the EU. But just to give you an example, we are having an open competition until mid-December, still for applying as a Eurotom Safeguards Inspector. We're not even starting from the base uh, salary in the higher category, um, but we are starting two steps above. And we are not having enough applicants such that we had to extend the deadline for applications. It is incredible. We can't attract people for nuclear safeguards in Luxembourg easily. And therefore, we 
need to rely on other channels. We need to do work with the JRC. We need to work with uh, academia. And I'm very grateful for everybody who is contributing to nuclear know-how uh, being maintained for the future. I'm telling people that safeguards is a long-lasting career. Even if Germany decides to opt out of nuclear and to shut down the last nuclear power plant end of March this year, the nuclear fuel will not disappear overnight. And there is no plan for a final repository in Germany. There is not even a location. So these are all things um, that require safeguards for quite an enormous amount of time. And new repositories, intermediate storages, final repositories will also require safeguards approaches. And there will not be a nuclear waste dump somewhere in the EU, one member state doing it for all of the others, no. There will be national concepts. So the Swedish are building repositories, the French are building their repository, the Finnish are starting next year. And this is all future development. Small modular reactors we need to have safeguards know-how around. So let me thank all of you who have contributed. Um, University Politecnico Milano, the JRC, with the efforts of driving this, um, the, the European Network for Education in, in Nuclear, um, the IAEA, and also all colleagues from the European Commission. Nuclear sometimes is a little bit like the um, forgotten child of the climate-friendly energy community, where everybody is rushing for wind, for solar, and for hydro. But the total calculations, the plans and the objectives for 2050 still require nuclear. And we cannot meet our climate goals and cannot meet the climate objectives if it wasn't also for a nuclear share in the EU. So thanks for contributing to this future and making it sustainable. Thank you very much, Stefan, uh, for the very comprehensive global picture overview of, uh, of the needs uh, that are uh, okay very clear for Europe but uh, also for uh, several countries of, of the people that are attending the second edition of the master uh, this is the same uh, the same situation uh, also in their countries the, the nuclear issue is becoming uh, even hotter uh, so I think that uh, we are addressing in the right time uh, the right topic with the, with this type of uh, education and path. Uh, thanks a lot, Stefan. St thanks a lot for your time. Um, let us move to the uh, a third contribution from uh, uh, the Joint Research Center. Uh, I think that. Uh, Ulla Engelmann, she's the director of nuclear safety and security. Uh, I suppose that she's connected. Yes. Uh, okay, we, we have a video. We video from uh, already from Ulla. Uh, okay, let us uh, watch and, and listen to the video. Good afternoon. As director of the Nuclear Safety and Security Director of the Joint Research Center of the European, European Commission, I'm particularly pleased to address you also at the official opening of the second edition of the Specialized Master in Nuclear Safeguards. I also appreciate the speeches held by the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Director of the
Ella fit also the programs of emergency preparedness and response, monitoring of radioactivity in the environment, nuclear forensics, medical applications of alpha emitting radioisotopes, and special nuclear materials for space. For a couple of weeks ago, we had Commissioner Breton participating in our 60th plus anniversary celebrations in Karlsruhe. We also had a dedicated full day workshop on technologies and capabilities available in Europe and abroad for the production of radioisotopes for use in medical applications, where currently there is a challenge worldwide due to the aging nuclear infrastructure and the need to maintain the skills and competences of people working in the nuclear field. The latter is also a large challenge in view of the increased interest in the future deployment of nuclear reactors to combat climate change and contribute to the Green Deal. This has also been announced during this weekend by uh, many leaders uh, of heads of states who want to triple nuclear power by 2050. And this is also true that they want to foster the development of the small modular reactors, but also building and operating of larger nuclear power plants. And several of European countries and many other nuclear newcomers outside uh, Europe have demonstrated this interest, particularly now also during the ongoing COP negotiations. It is therefore very encouraging that this unique educational program that was implemented for the first time in the years 21-22 with the funding of European Commission's DG INPA can now be repeated and I learned that there was an even larger expression of interest for enrollment in this program with over 100 interested students from which in the end only 21 could be retained from countries outside the European Union, in addition to a few students also from Europe and or international organizations. As you will certainly know, nuclear safeguards is a cornerstone in the peaceful deployment of nuclear technology. And during this year, you will learn about many facets in this field, which contains legal issues, political commitments, technical verifications, analytical measurements, as well as elements of open source analysis, for example, using satellite imagery and data analysis of trading of sensitive or dual use components and technologies. This and much more, you will have the chance to dive in during the next 15 months. And I am pleased that several of the key chart scientists of my organizations are participating to the lecturing of this program. In fact, the JRC Directorate Nuclear Safety and Security is located on four sites in Europe. The largest one, fully dedicated to the safety of the nuclear fuel cycle, the high level waste management, and the analytical measurements for nuclear safeguards and security, is located in Karlsruhe, southwest of Germany, from where I'm addressing you right now. A second nuclear site is located in Giel, Belgium mainly dealing with basic physical measurements, reference materials, and monitoring of radioactivity in the environment. The site in Petten on the seashore in the Netherlands deals mainly with reactor safety, whereas safeguard relevant work of the ISPRA site in, in Italy focuses on containment and surveillance, advanced verification technologies, and strategic trade control. You will in fact have the opportunity to visit the JRC ISPRA site laboratories and discuss with the scientists and experts during the basic laboratories about halfway through the program. Equally important are the opportunities to identify one or the other scientific R&D topic from the JRC nuclear safeguards program that could be of interest for your stay in the advanced laboratory period, which will also constitute the start of your master's thesis. 
I'm confident that one or the other of our scientists will be happy to mentor you in case you demonstrate a specific interest for the activities in our labs. To conclude, let me state that I'm also particularly pleased with the gender balance in the student population and I welcome the participants with different backgrounds and education signed up as the discussions between yourself and the exchange of experience with the lecturers will definitely also constitute an important element in your education. With this, I wish you a very successful year full of new experience and knowledge gathering. And thus, it might well be that during one of your stays here in Europe, we can also meet one or the other in person. Thanks a lot, and I wish you a good continuation and start of the course. I have to, to thank Director uh, Ulang for the uh, for the speech, but uh, most of all for the help that JRC is uh, always offering uh, since the first edition uh, to our master. Uh, I I ask uh, William to to bring to to Ula our our most. Uh, grateful thanks. Um, we should have now the contribution from uh, uh, Isis Leslie, director of the World Nuclear University. I don't know whether uh, we have time because uh, Leslie uh, said that uh, it should be available by uh, 3 p.m. So we have one or, one or two minutes. I don't know whether uh we can wait or uh ask electra to to uh to give him to give the speech uh, uh her point of view from uh, uh from the international partnership uh, dg thank you electra thank you professor uh, ricotti um so I'm the third speaker from the European Commission. This might sound confusing to to you. It's totally normal. Believe me, we are all confused sometimes. Uh, but uh, the the difference from from what I represent and my previous uh, colleagues speakers is that uh, we deal with international cooperation for nuclear safety. Uh, um, Widely apart and very important aspect, and this is of course where this masters is has been organized in particular for all these non-EU countries that are developing and want to strengthen their safeguards. So, um, as I mentioned earlier when we started that uh, our international nuclear uh, safety cooperation program, uh, that is three areas. One is to to uh, uh, enhance uh, uh, nuclear culture in management and nuclear the other is to safe safe st uh, uh, storage of nuclear waste and nuclear material and the third one is safeguards safeguards have not been the biggest and the most important since the beginning part but is catching up with the rest because it's more and more more and more important what we do uh, mainly in my in my uh, uh, sector is that we are uh, launching projects which um, can either be bilateral, uh, have, having uh, supporting uh, some countries in in developing their uh, safeguards culture. Let's say now I'm focusing only on safeguards, no safeguards culture, uh, or in some region of the world, or we have also this multi-country, as I would say. Uh, training uh, projects that develop the training that can be then available to all. Uh, similarly, we are also financing other organizations uh, that are that are doing training. For example, very important uh, partner is the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is also uh, um, with our financial support organizing a number a lot of training. And of course, we we work with. Uh, partners like the European Network of uh, Nuclear Education Network and many universities that are developing uh, the trainings and <clears throat> uh, and um, uh, so 
and of course this master that we are that we are now in the in the second edition and now our perspectives we want to do more of it and better of it this is what we are looking ahead to do uh, for example as i just said having more more editions of this very successful master ongoing uh, having more training that uh, that 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 we have already developed or we still need to develop to come up and be available. I see two, two things that we need to take into consideration here, two key conditions. First of all, we need to achieve better cooperation among the, the partners so we can ensure that we don't duplicate, let's say, trainings or we ensure that we can use uh, uh, one another or do something even together, which is very important because to make them more efficient and more we're reaching the most biggest possible number of participants. And the other is also that we need to have a better overview of what are the needs around the world. We are, we have, let's say, but but this is, you know, it is never enough. So because this is where we base our our uh, our planning, our strategic planning, better overview of the needs around the world and also, uh, also of what exists other from partners, either here and there. So we can, we can, as I say, do our job in a way that is the most efficient possible. Um, thank you. This is, this is, this was all I had to say for my own, for my part. And thank you. Thank you, Electra. Uh, thank you for, uh, in, for your interest, for your activity, for for your help uh, in uh, in following and supporting the the master. Um, now let us give the floor to Isis Leslie. I see she's connected. She's the World Nuclear University director. Uh, so uh, Isis, what what about uh, the, your point of view? Uh, that is a, a very comprehensive point of view the, of the World Nuclear University about nuclear safeguards. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join earlier. Um, I was on other meetings, but this this is a really important initiative. And uh, the World Nuclear University and, of course, the World Nuclear Association, we really applaud these measures which are being put in place by you all to ensure that there is going to be a talent pipeline to make sure that we can fulfill our obligations for the future. So I'm sure it's already been discussed on this call, but we are really excited to be seeing the uh, the initiative coming out of COP28 um, and the, the intention to triple nuclear capacity over the next coming years. And if we are going to be able to meet these obligations, if we're going to take that seriously, we are going to need a large number of new people coming into the industry at all different subjects, but particularly in safeguards and security. So I think it's really wonderful that this initiative is happening in in at the same time um, as that is occurring and people will start to look at the industry as a very exciting and uh, interesting place to work. I know certainly um, I my background is actually in nuclear security and I did quite a lot of work in the safeguards and non-proliferation side of things. So I think it should be something which will be really interesting for everybody to hear about. So the World Nuclear University, as you guys know, is a uh, the education arm of the World Nuclear Association. So we tend to focus more on mid-career um, and future leaders of our industry. Our general age range is around 35 of our participants. So we are really hopeful to start reaching out and working with various universities around the world who have programs such as this, so that there is an awareness and an understanding throughout these programs that uh, nuclear is a very holistic industry, a very global industry, that the impact of any one area has a huge impact on the rest of us as an industry. So we really do hope that we can reach out and work with you all as 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 these programs evolve and make sure that the lessons that you are learning as you put together these programs are transferred really effectively. I know Gabriel, for example, and many of you are also working on how to ensure that this collaboration is a part of what you are doing and that lessons learned are transferred successfully. But if you guys can think of anything that there is that we can do at the World Nuclear University or the World Nuclear Association, which would help further that, we would be very happy to get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aziz. Um, I guess that even if we just double the, the global power, nuclear power in the world, we should multiply by several times 
times this addition of the master of safeguard because there is a huge need uh, of, of experience of uh, uh, of education and training and, and on workforce also on this critical uh, topic uh, of safeguards. Thank you very much, Aziz, for being with us today. Thanks a lot. And now, uh, last but not least, we have a, a small surprise because uh, who better than the people that already attended the first edition to share with us their experience and, and, and the future, the perspective on the safeguard. Let me introduce, first of all, Professor Tahal Aluzami. Uh, he is uh, from King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology. Thank you, Takal, for being with us. And uh, let us share with you, with, with us, uh, your uh, your personal experience or personal view on uh, on nuclear safeguards. Thank you, Takal. Uh, do you guys uh, hear me? Do you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear it. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Ricotti. Uh, uh, and hello, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tagal Al Hazami. I'm the head of uh, Nuclear uh, Control Unit at King Abdulaziz uh, City for Science and Technology. King Abdulaziz is the owner and the host of the first uh, Saudi nuclear research reactor. And after this quick introduction, and I would like to take this uh, our host for uh, uh, inviting me uh, today to share with you uh, some of my views and uh, personal experience. And also, I want uh, I won't uh, forget to congratulate the participant of the second uh, edition of the uh, Safeguard Specialized uh, Master. So, uh, congratulations to uh, uh, all of you. Uh, you deserve to be part of this uh, amazing course. And I want to uh, uh, say congratulations only, but uh, also uh, welcome to the Nuclear uh, uh, Safeguard uh, uh, Committee. Uh, last year, I was uh, honored to participate in the first edition of the uh, uh, Safeguard Specialized uh, Master. And thanks to AN, uh, AN for uh, sponsoring uh, 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 financially the, the course. And, and to, to be honest with you, uh, right after the course, after we graduated, I wasn't expecting uh, a short-term impact uh, uh, in my career. So we went back uh, working in the normal work routine and, and uh, everything with the with the safeguard or security topic, uh, my line manager always uh, passed it to me. So uh, with the uh, uh, open access that we have in the uh, specialized master course, uh, uh, thank you guys for that as well. Uh, I were able to uh, went back and refresh some of uh, my information and uh, uh, I worked in a couple of uh, technical report and uh, did my best to uh, 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 help my organization to help the top management in my organization to understand the implication of uh, safeguard commitment and also uh, to to pave uh, ways and balancing the nuclear uh, policy and the nuclear the security and safeguard implication and 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 uh, 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 one of the reports that uh, I worked on is it was about the nuclear safeguard commitment as as a, a national level, uh, and I sent it to the uh, CAX president. Uh, and after that, he, he, uh, my land manager told me that he he liked it so much. So six six week or eight week after that one, uh, I was uh, uh, surprised with the nomination uh, uh, for a high level committee at the. Uh, Saudi uh, uh, bureau expert at the uh, Saudi council minister, and uh, usually in my country, I know it's it's different from country to other. Uh, uh, usually, a nomination for this uh, uh, high level uh, uh, committee goes to uh, 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 expert with uh, fifteen to uh, twenty years of uh, uh, solid experience. But I think uh, 
what I gained during the uh, safeguard course, the knowledge I gained during the safeguard course that I were able to put it in the report and I were able to deliver it through uh, a different presentation to my manager, the uh, mid manager and the uh, VBs in my uh, organization allow me for uh, a better uh, opportunity. And, and as I told you, I, I wasn't expecting that short term impact in my career. And, 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 and today, uh, I am a member of uh, two high level committee at uh, the Saudi Council uh, Minister, and and uh, 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 that that was what was uh, uh, one of the major impact that uh, I can uh, tell you about. And I'm very sure uh, that all of the new participants of the second edition, uh, once they done uh, the course, they will uh, do uh, way better than me. Once you put the uh, sufficient time to uh, master the material, to understand uh, all of the uh, uh, sessions in there, to understand all of the methodology to understand all of the uh, aspects that uh, put in the uh, safeguard course um definitely will guys uh, do way uh, better than me and and last point that uh, i want to uh, conclude with it's it's one of the points that was addressed very well at the uh, first edition of the safeguard uh, special master it was about uh, the uh, bias awareness we all have uh, uh, we all have uh, bias so based in our different phase and different culture uh, 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 in the safeguard uh, 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 in the safeguard uh, community we need to be aware of our bias so we can we can uh, able to communicate effectively with each other and and we can able to uh, build uh, a long uh, term uh, uh, lasting partnership because as as you know uh, uh, the special uh, thing about the safeguard community is uh, a multinational uh, 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 community it's uh, uh, people from everywhere from uh, each part of uh, the world uh, so uh, they have different race different culture different color different language different accent so uh, ra raising the the uh, your awareness about the bias will will not just help you help you by itself but it will also help the uh, uh, atmospheric uh, the nuclear safeguards atmospheric to to be able to uh, uh, reach to a great uh, uh, group uh, uh, accomplishment so that's that's basically what i want to uh, uh, share with you guys and 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 uh, thank you for uh, allowing me and give me this uh, chance to to communicate with the with the uh, second edition thank you thank you thank you takal um, I had to thank you also because you were one of the most active uh, and uh, proactive uh, um, person attending the, the the master in the first edition. Thank you for your uh, your very active collaboration. Uh, as it was very active, the, the second speaker, Miss Marwa Ibrahim, uh, from uh, the Egypt Young Generation President. Uh, she is now led specialist at Azerosatom in Egypt. Uh, thank you, Marva, for being with us. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, congratulations on starting the second edition of Specializing Master in Nuclear Safeguard. Uh, also, I'm sending my heartfelt congratulations to um, our master student colleague about the remarkable accomplishment of being accepted in the first university in Italy and Europe, Polytechnic at Milano. Uh, actually, this is a special milestone in your career path to become with a professional unique community in nuclear safeguard. So let me uh, share some steps um, for me, personal experience in nuclear safeguard. Actually, before acceptance, I um, over the last four years to embark, I embarked on a journey to practic practically explore nuclear security and, and safeguard activities at international levels. I seize all opportunities that help me to digest all international nuclear safeguard regime and the technology behind non-proliferation with outstanding educational opportunity from, for example, Los Alamos National Lab, Brookhaven National Lab and Center of Non-proliferation and KCL and the ISARDA course that Dr. William um, pointed out. Uh, so this course uh, organized by in the GRC. So I highly recommend that you take this 
uh, course because I come up with a wealth of knowledge that encouraged me to dive into next step in my career path in nuclear security and nuclear safeguard. Actually, after this, uh, I, I did my research in, um, on searching for a university that offers certificate for safeguard. Um, actually, I find in USA, but the problem was that without practical experience and some university offer uh, without no fund opportunity, and, and also this is not affordable uh, for us. So uh, I'm so grateful that uh, all organizers of this master, ENN and the IAA and GRC, that offer uh, generous funding for this uh, master degree. Uh, from my point of view, I think that they know the recipe of success in nuclear safeguard. Uh, because from my personal experience, I guarantee that uh, you will receive interdisciplinary education at intersection between engineering and political science. This combination not available elsewhere. Um, in addition, also, as I said, with some E and EN, you will uh, secure unique educational uh, opportunity. You will not find like this world led widely. Uh, on top of that, uh, the on job training uh, in Advanced Lab will introduce you to novel uh, technology for implementing nuclear safeguard, especially if you come from a country with no advanced lab like me. So this is for me very um, beneficial uh, to, to take the training in, in, in this advanced lab. So the master degree in, in, uh, in nuclear safeguard improved my profile as a prospective nuclear uh, safeguard inspector by helping me to bridge this gap between my qualifications and, and IAA expectation. Uh, so I am proud that 62 students worldwide competed for this master. My admission ranking number was number five, me and the Dr. Stuckel. Uh, so we are selected from very competitive list of students and I was uh, granted full scholarship and obtained EN, EN fellowship. So thank you so much. So now how this ref reflect on my past in career in, in, in nuclear industry. Actually, you know that Egypt now is building its first nuclear power plant in its Daba project. So after graduation, I secured a job at one of the top global company in this uh, project. Uh, and uh, also, uh, therefore, master degree boosted my employability and increased my ability to be part and participate in the nuclear workforce. Um, actually making career in a, in a male dominated field like nuclear industry with many nationalities is it challenging. However, I'm proud that this Egyptian woman from younger generations that it, I, I work it in it Daba project in industrial radiography. So I'm, I'm grateful for giving me this brilliant education opportunity that encourage the employee to hire me and the trust from my knowledge. And uh, finally, if you need to take away message from, from, from this, um, me, I, I encourage myself and you to keep learning in, in three domains, safety and security and safeguard, and be flexible and resilient and open to multicultural intersection, which is consistent another cornerstone to your success in a, as a safeguard inspector in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let, let me thanks a lot both Marwa and Takal for the collaboration, but I would say especially for the enthusiasm that they uh, they put in, uh, in in the experience of, of the master uh, uh, and starting the the networking uh, among the the participants, and uh, I think that you can count on them also to continue the the collaboration also for the second edition and for the the, the future network of, of the participants on on the master of on safeguards. Thank you very much, Marwa. Thank you very much, Takal. Uh, we have completed the session, the second session, and now we can give the floor uh, to Willem for the third and last session on the evolving landscape of nuclear safeguards. Please, uh, Willem. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marco, and um, good afternoon again. Um, we heard a lot about the, uh, let's say, input from the organizing organizations we heard from the previous students uh, we wanted to spend half an hour this afternoon also to give our lecturers uh, a possibility to contribute and share some uh, let's say new insights uh, with the future students the ones that started last week 
Um, the title here of this small panel is Evolving Landscape of Nuclear Safeguards. Um, and in fact, we've uh, compiled a few questions that you saw in the agenda, a few topics that we want to discuss. Uh, I'm pleased to see that we have, I think, about 12 of our lecturers uh, connected by video. There is uh, Tarek Rauf, Jacques Bot, Matteo Gellini, Filippo Sevini, Katrina Emmons, Luc van den Durpel, Klaus Meyer, uh, Davide Borto, Michel Contin, Paolo Perani, and Ivo Alejno. If I didn't forget anybody, that's the ones I saw just a minute ago. And in fact, what, what we wanted to, to uh, share with the students in this short session is that, that there is a really strong evolving landscape. I mean, since we've put the uh, first program together with the scientific committee that Marco mentioned, and we are extremely grateful colleagues gave to build the program, I mean, lots of things have been happening in the last one and a half year. I mean, to start with the very positive ones, it was mentioned before, tripling of the nuclear energy output by 2050 as uh, declared by 22 countries in the COP28. Um, Closer to home, um, we had the uh, nuclear alliance in, in Europe with uh, 16 countries that uh, were pleased to see that nuclear is now a part of the, uh, let's say, Green Deal in Europe and therefore has an opportunity to develop further. Uh, we had the uh, announcement by the European Commission to create this industry alliance for uh, SMRs, uh, building upon the pre-partnership, basically. Uh, and you might have heard that uh, in the two countries that are around the table here, like uh, from Italy, we have the, the recent initiative of the Sustainable Nuclear Energy Platform. Um, and uh, the Belgian Prime Minister in, announced that there will be in March 24 a nuclear energy summit at the level of heads of state. So you see that there is lots of things uh, happening, not to uh, not the least, of course, related to the small modular reactors or the advanced modular reactors. So many positive signals that nuclear is coming out of the dark after a number of years where uh, nuclear was kind of taboo and, and, and there was no discussion about it. Uh, now we see that there is definitely a regained interest and this was also at the highest level confirmed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. At the same time, uh, we are moving, we are living in very, uh, let's say, turbulent times. Uh, there are going, uh, unfortunately, both by countries which do have nuclear weapons, one at the, the, the border of the European Union in Ukraine, as you know, the other in the Middle East. So. There's quite a lot of reasons to be concerned as well, and, and it's making possibly the topic of nuclear non-proliferation even more important these days. So uh, based on all these elements, we wanted to um, collect a few, let's say, insights, a few remarks of our uh, course lectures uh, to, in fact, allow the students to appreciate that whereas the, let's say, implementation of safeguards is a well-established and long-standing experience, there are all these new elements that will pro provide or uh, deliver ad additional challenges. And that would be uh, interesting to build into the course. So uh, we might have thought last year when we built our modules that this was going to be valid for the next 10 years. But uh, in fact, it will require some updates and some new insights will have to come in, I think, based on everything which uh, is uh, happening around us. So. Um, as I had the chance to speak with a few of the lecturers before, I will call out a few colleagues, but then uh, the others that are connected are very welcome to switch on their mic and their video and come in with their remarks on one or the other topic as they are listed on the screen here. So the first thing we uh, wanted to have a small discussion about with, with the colleagues is what in fact the impact is of these geopolitical developments, uh, let it be because of the uh, wars I mentioned or because of just the sheer number of growing and or the uh, the hype of these small modern reactors. Uh, and, and I'll call out first, uh, if Luc doesn't mind, Luc van den Durpel, which uh, is our, let's say, perhaps strongest industry representative here uh, and that uh, at the minimum about SMRs and possibly also about the other topics. So Luc, I mean, Thank you, Willem. Nice to see you all again. Uh, and well, enjoying it a lot that there's a second edition because it's uh, it's proving that there's traction, but more than traction, there's a need for it as it has been mentioned already multiple times. Yes, COP28, but also whatever was mentioned already by Willem shows that even if we're staying with the LWR technology nowadays, tripling the big LWRs worldwide will be already a challenge, not only from industry, but also from, you know, the, sec uh, the security and the safeguards challenges that we will have, being it on human resources for the agency, being it for Euratom, being it for uh, doesn't matter who. Now, if we're looking to, if we really want to 
exploit the potential that nuclear energy has and the nuclear energy, you know, high energy density, low transport needed per terawatt hour and all those, you know, nice features. We will have to live with a nuclear maybe by the 2050s, where we will not only apply nuclear onshore with the big LWRs like we know them, but potentially like we know them, but potentially also with LWR kind small modular reactors that do have their own challenges with regard to fuel because you're considering higher rich fuels, being it even ALU fuels for those that are aware about those developments, which is already posing some uh, new challenges, but new approaches as well required with regard to the security and the safeguarding of those. But not only that, we are currently working as well with industry and typically the non-nuclear typical industry, let's say that power production in the nuclear technology and so on with the SMR. In the same time, we have a, a real, real serious international global um, context situation with very serious crisis derived from the war that you mentioned uh, and you mentioned correctly how the uh, some nuclear states are directly involved in this new war but the point in my opinion to because i'm an historian so i try to draw some lesson from history not directly but I think that the main experience that I want to report to the um, to the master students for this new edition was the Euratom experience. So how to face uh, big challenges, conflict, past and, and ongoing through cooperation, through integration and through integration in the nuclear sector. A peaceful integration that means also to create a, a safeguard system which was proved as successful as the Raton one. I think that this could be a good uh, uh, example of the past to face the, the new challenges but also the new opportunities of the SMR in this sense because I think that for a while for all this long time in which nuclear power seemed to be put in the in the back end in the, in the out of the um, energy production outlook uh, the proliferation doesn't belong directly to uh, the countries which has uh, which have already uh, nuclear power running we had a sort of uh, crystallized situation in which the risk was not so hard of proliferation in recent years, despite some cases, but it was not so globally uh, uh, a problem, the, the, the nuclear proliferation. But in the new time, in these new times of, uh, of, of troubles, of losing of a, um, yeah, an international consensus, as we had in past decades, I think that the strong of regional cooperation, the strength of regional cooperation, and in particular, the EU could provide a good example of developing nuclear, uh, nuclear energy, nuclear technology for all the application, not only for power production, keeping a, a, a strong safeguard system, keeping a, a strong, peaceful commitment for development in a certain way or the uh, reliance to the international uh, agreements which contribute to limit the spreading of nuclear weapons. That's the point. I think that this model could not be applied uh, barely in the other, uh, in other situation, in other region, in other areas, but we could try to put the better to try the better, uh, to draw the better uh, experience for, 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 uh, for the Euratom history and for the current EU history. Thank you. 
Thank you, Matteo. And in fact, I uh, would elaborate in your detailed lecture also on the Eurotom history and the treaty. So um, I want to turn to Tariq shortly um, as a basically extension of the lecture that he gave in module one, which was already touching upon lots of the geopolitical developments. Tariq, if you want to come in, please. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you? Yeah, unfortunately, I still having problems turning on my camera, but I'll still speak. So in, in general terms, um, as has been already discussed, we are hearing about a new nuclear renaissance, particularly new technologies for power generation, uh, especially small modular reactors. More countries are expressing interest in this. Uh, nuclear energy is now recognized as contributing to sustainable development and achieving uh, carbon um, minimization goals, climate goals, which is a break with the past. And also international financial institutions like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund, which in the past did not want to fund uh, construction of nuclear power plants are revisiting uh, their policies. Um, this is not the first time that we have heard about a resurgence uh, of interest in uh, nuclear energy. In the 1970s, there was also such talk, and then later in the 80s, but for a variety of reasons, those nuclear renaissances never really materialized. And the high and the low uh, nuclear energy growth projections by the Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris and by the IAEA also had to be revised. So we need to see how this develops. At the IAEA, there is a new project on standardization and harmonization of licensing and safeguards approaches for small and modular reactors. I understand that there are somewhere around 80 different designs uh, under uh, investigation, of which, which apparently three are uh, closer to uh, deploying what's called a first-of-a-kind kind reactor, which of course will be more expensive, and then if the technology works, then subsequent units uh, following economies of scale would be much more uh, affordable. Recently in the United States, there was a setback where one uh, SMR project was canceled. So again, we need to see how this uh, optimism about small modular reactors is, is going to turn out. At the international diplomatic level, given the war in Ukraine and now the war in Gaza, as has already been indicated, we have a lot of disturbance in, uh, the, multilateral, in the multilateral nuclear arms control and disarmament for us, such as the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly, which is where resolutions are adopted on uh, safeguards uh, or verification, arms control, disarmament, and so on. Uh, this year, the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, Preparatory Committee meeting held in Vienna in, in August failed to agree on a set of recommendations. And as you remember, um, last year, the 10th NPT Review Conference also failed to agree on an outcome document Although, fortunately, there was a good discussion on Pillar 2 and Pillar 3. So Pillar 2 talks about uh, nuclear verification and nuclear security. And in Pillar 3, which is peaceful uses of nuclear energy, we deal with uh, nuclear safety. So particularly from the group of 10, which is a group of countries here in Vienna, at the IAEA, they produce a lot of useful language, which is taken from the resolutions adopted at the IAEA General Conference, which is held in uh, September every year. And in these resolutions, there is a lot of uh, reaffirmation about the role of nuclear power generation uh, for developing countries, for existing users, for newcomers, uh, establishing um, uh, guideposts, so to speak, for newcomer countries on how to safely and securely embark on uh, nuclear power programs and also to create the regulatory infrastructure for the regulation and licensing of uh, nuclear activities in newcomer countries, and also for construction operation of the reactors. 
and also not forgetting that at the end of the life cycle of the reactors, there will be spent fuels, which will need to be stored, dispositioned, um, and uh, therefore to look at uh, newcomer countries to look at uh, entering the nuclear power generation business in the minimum of a hundred year um, cycle, five, 10 years to set up the plans, to uh, do the licensing, to do the contracting, another five or six, seven years, and then the well-built and well-maintained reactors will continue to generate electricity for 60 years or so, and then we have the end-of-life uh, issues. Uh, on, on safeguards, unfortunately, even now, 25 years after the additional protocol was uh, approved by the IAEA Board of Governors in 1997, there is still a disagreement in the IAEA Board of Governors about making the additional protocol mandatory for non-proliferation treaty, non-nuclear weapon states parties, which uh, have to have uh, IMSERC 153 or the standard safe comprehensive or full scope safeguards agreement uh, with the IAEA. So the additional protocol doesn't create new legal obligations on the part of non-nuclear weapon states the legal obligation is already contained in the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, IMSERC 153, which is that all nuclear material and all nuclear activities in a non-nuclear weapon state must be declared to the IAEA and used exclusively for peaceful purposes. And the IAEA must be given access to operating records, uh, access to facilities, technology, personnel, for verifying. And what the additional protocol did was it provided additional tools, uh, such as environmental monitoring, uh, long-term visas for inspectors, uh, uh, generally speaking, one-year uh, duration visas, so the agency doesn't have to go periodically for the renewal of visas, uh, and uh, uh, more detailed reporting, and also extending the starting point of safeguards to, to mining, okay. and therefore, with the, you want me to stop? <laughs> Some of it will be covered in the course as well. Okay. Then. So, uh, All right. but I, I was wrap up, that would to... be nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I was the reason why I was going through this that there is a new challenge, uh, and that is uh, spread of technology for nuclear-powered submarines. So, mm -hmm. Article Three of the NPT calls for safeguards on peaceful activities, and therefore it leaves open the option of so-called non-peaceful activities or military activities that are not prescribed, such as uh, nuclear-powered submarines. And, and this exception was created in 1967-68, particularly at the instance of, insistence of Italy, which was looking at nuclear-powered ships, just as Germany had a nuclear-powered cargo ships, Otto Hahn, the Japanese had the Mutsu, the Americans had the Savannah, uh, but that technology really didn't materialize. But in IMSERC 153, in Article 14, there is an exception for non-prescribed military uses. And now we have the challenge where Australia will get a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines that will use 93% enriched, uh, highly enriched uh, uranium, uh, roughly 200 kilograms uh, per submarine, which will be completely outside of safeguards. And it's now been two years since the project was announced and the IAE, unfortunately, to my regret, has not yet come up with a safeguards approach or safeguards objectives for verifying this. And Brazil also has a nuclear submarine development program, but that is an indigenous program and they apparently use uh, low enriched uranium and the Argentine Brazil Agency for Accounting and Control uh, under the quadripartite agreement with the IAEA considers nuclear ship propulsion uh, a peaceful activity. So again, how this will be defined remains open. And so I think these are new safeguards challenges that are before us that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tariq, for pointing that so the students will see that there is still new approaches to be developed and, and challenges ahead. Um, I, I wanted to change gears for a moment and, and uh, take a few of the topics that are later in the um, on the list. There are technological advancements, challenges in implementing safeguards in terms of data authentication or, or information overload.
load, uh, also the use of machine learning and, and, and other new developments. And for that, uh, I wanted to show to, to uh, transition to Jacques Bot, which um, is connected as well and has been actively participating in the first session also. So Jacques, if you want to come in on those topics and related ones, please do so. Thank you, Willem. <coughs> Pardon. Yes, I mean, there have been so many uh, good points made by uh, by the previous speakers. I'll try not to not to duplicate things. Uh, the challenges for safeguards have always been uh, big, uh, in particular with regard to, based on the lessons learned of Iraq, how to identify the possible existence of undeclared activities. Uh, and I must say that at this point in time, when we look at the geopolitical tensions, uh, the uncertainty with regard to um, political evolutions in multiple aspects, uh, that may become a challenge bigger than it has ever been. Uh, in this context, it is clear that, as I remember, state in the, for during the general conference of the IEA always repeat, we need to strengthen effectiveness and improve efficiency. So, uh, as the world is changing, as the um, resources, at least at this point in time, there have not been any uh, assessment of the consequences with regard to how much resource we could, uh, we would need to put in place. Uh, I expect that there have been the, the, the ongoing development in particular in the area, for instance, of artificial intelligence will allow to dramatically change the approach that we can have in particular in terms of information, but not only. Uh, better exploiting images, for instance, uh, from uh, the confinement surveillance is also benefiting from it. Uh, when we look at identifying possible collaborations uh, that could lead to uh, the development of knowledge that could have applications for uh, the development of, at least at the beginning, undeclared uh, program, uh, we've made already in the IEA serious breakthroughs with regard to using the AI. Of course, when we talk about such a novel technology, uh, there are lots of concerns with regard to can it be misused? Can the AI in particular be misled in the way it draws its conclusions? So uh, this is an area where we need to take into account in the early stage of uh, the issues of ethics, the issue of, of bias, impossible bias, and so on. But again, if there is a need to illustrate how exciting the field of safeguards is and how it can be, that is the area of AI is one of the areas which is uh, essential. There is another aspect on which I would be keen on emphasizing uh, shortly is the fact that a master's like, like this one allows to bring together people from multiple origins, but also to address the multiple facets of safeguards. And in the context of uh, a new uh, renaissance of safeguards or of an increased level of threat to the non-proliferation non regime, having a roster, if not a critical mass, sorry to use a trivial, of individuals who understand the extent of the competence that need to be engaged, of the partners that need to be brought on board, uh, will for sure help in ensuring that safeguards will develop in a uh, better order and uh, with a broader understanding, not only of the microcosm that we often feel we are, but with a group of people that can spread what the needs are and explain why safeguards is important, including in the context of this uh, re renew renewed renaissance.
I think the mic was off. So thanks, thanks, Jacques, for sharing those insights as well. And and many of those will be also elaborated later on uh, in the course. And you will be coming back also at the last session uh, the, with the outsides and challenges of uh, safeguards. Um, before closing, I want to perhaps quickly uh, turn to um, our more colleagues with more legal background. Uh, I see Contain Michel as, as professor from the Azure Connected. So um, Contain, you might want to share some of the just in a few minutes, one or two challenges that you see also there outcoming for the uh, students of safeguards that uh, are listening into this session. So over. Thank you, William. Thanks a lot. Well, I will not be long because most of the things have been already said, but for legal connections, interesting legal connections. One of us have raised the topic of the submarine, uh, which is clearly something would be quite challenging from an export control point of view. Because as you all know, I mean, before we were only considering nuclear submarine for nuclear weapon states, but presently we are facing the case of two non-nuclear weapon states who might go ahead. And of course, it raises a lot of questions regarding how to apply safeguards to, to, to nuclear submarines. When we talk about treaties, I mean, again, um, I, I know this is a whole topic, but remain a lot of concern for us, which is the case of North Korea, how to deal with uh, countries who, who decide to get out uh, and the continuity of safeguard, it remains the topics, it remains something that should be considered. And, and as well, because you talk about your geo, geopolitical issue, if I look what has happened since the recent years, I mean, uh, there's a conflict um, uh, or the invasion of uh, Russia by Ukraine, or the contrary, sorry. Um, it raised a lot of concern as well regarding the application of safeguard or to when you have occupied countries or, or you have to deal with such kind of issue. So yes, we have a series of topics that are popping up recently um, where they raise a lot of technical, but as well as, as legal, because the starting point, I, shall, I like to remind it, the starting point of safeguard was to allow the trade, uh, was to allow nuclear trade. That was the initial point. Without safeguard, we could not develop peaceful applications. And, um, and of course, you need, a co you need a contract between the different actors. Firstly, of course, the suppliers, the end users, but as well as the agency. It's a contract, it's a legal issue again. So all those elements um, are only be a bit shaken by the recent event. And I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss about it. I mean, I can even popping up the question of sanction and safeguard, or to deal the question of sanction and safeguard together. So again, if you spend the next two hours on those discussions, I'm fully available with them, but I guess you don't want to do it. So I'll just stop now by identifying a series of the potential topics. Thanks a lot, Conte. Is it on this? Yes. So, and thanks for uh, all the other uh, colleagues that intervened shortly. Uh, there are a few more that are online, but obviously time does not allow to take everybody now. It was more as an extension of the first module, which the students went through already last week, and that is a kind of a, an outlook for the future to have an additional appetizer, basically, illustrating that this area continues to be uh, a very active area. Um, I see Katrina switching on the video. Would you like to come in shortly, Katrina? You're welcome. You're muted still. We don't hear you. No, we cannot hear you. No. Okay. Was there any of the other lecturers that are connected that would like still to say hello or, or share quickly an idea? If you do, plus switch on the mic and the video. Don't see an immediate reaction. So then, thanks a lot once more for this uh, short discussion. And uh, this concludes, in fact, the uh, small panel debate we wanted to have, uh, as I said, as an appetizer and, and also as an information session for all the people that were listening in. And with that, I uh, hand back over to uh, Professor Ricotti. Marco, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you to, to everybody. Thank you to the, to the teachers. Uh, thank you to Willem for uh, for managing the the session. Uh, we have uh, the the activities for the opening ceremony. Uh, 
leaving the, the floor to Katarina for the, the closure. We thank all the participants, uh, the, the new students of the second edition, the past student of the first edition, uh, the teachers and the representative of the organization, uh, European organization and extra European organizations for joining us today for uh, uh, the opening ceremony. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have, a, have a good work for, uh, for your future activities in the master. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Marco. So, well, we, are, we reached uh, the end of our ceremony and uh, I believe that you all enjoyed uh, being with And this appetizer, as William uh, calls it, was uh, tasty. <laughs> and you are now encouraged to go ahead and get uh, more knowledge and uh, if we speak about students and uh, from the lecturer's point of view to uh, get encouraged by the uh, classroom we uh, built for you uh, and we hope that it will be a very uh, interesting uh, common uh, co cooperate mutual cooperation uh, between uh, students and lecturers and also the project team is always uh, ready to support you and we are happy that uh, we are we all are involved in this uh, very important topic uh, and we are dealing with improvement uh, and we are facilitating uh, implementation of nuclear safeguards in europe and in not in the countries uh, which are not uh, outside of europe so thank you everybody we are, uh, be with you and uh, so you know your schedule. Uh, we continue to uh, cooperate during uh, by the emails. Uh, we, you always can contact uh, us, the project team, me in particular, and uh, Polimi, uh, uh, cooperation uh, and technical team. So thank you. And uh, if you uh, suddenly uh, missed some parts of our nice opening ceremony. It is uh, available uh, at the website and you can uh, check it and uh, or if maybe you are interested in uh, watching it one more time, just check the Polymi website and uh, there it is. So thank you very much. And, and see you soon next year at the beginning of next year live. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right.